Okay. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce Dan Robertson from the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, where Dan is a research fellow. He is the vice president for digital technology, and he is the director for of the Applied Data Sciences Center. So Dan's done a lot in his career. Um, he actually held positions at IU. He's published nearly 70 articles, given dozens of presentations, book chapters, et cetera. So he's a card-carrying academic, but he also went to uh, Eli Lilly and did was very successful and is very successful in the commercial space where he's the senior director for research IT there. So Dan's going to tell us a little bit about IBRI today and a little bit more about himself, I'm sure. So take it away, Dan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I almost we, we branded this title um, based upon uh, the, uh, the prior talk in terms of Tale of Two gal Galaxies, do something like A Journey Through the History of Time or maybe even uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer on that and come forward. What I want to do, and for those who are data and, and go in, we already are 8% of the my slides in. Uh, the bad news is I've got a lot of builds and so there's a lot of content on the slides. I'll go through, but really what I want to do in this first talk was introduce me a little bit um, so you know where I come from, um, sort of both from my skills, from my, my career. Um, talk about IBRI, where we're trying to change uh, how we do some things in translational. Um, and uh, this organization is definitely a key part that integrates with IBRI. Uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing, how we're trying to drive this innovation, um, and then talk a little bit about what's going to happen just a little bit north of us. Um, so it's going to be really high level. I'm going to go relatively quick, um, and then my hope is that I can come back and delve into, into topics a little more uh, deeper as we go. Um, so quick thing about me, uh, as Sean had introduced me, uh, I do have a um, PhD in physical chemistry. I did teach in labs, but almost always was doing uh, computational research um, in terms of there. Uh, I then uh, went to the Naval Research Lab, did simulations there on supercomputers uh, of what we call chemically sustained shock waves and uh, energetic materials, which is basically detonations and explosives, um, but a great way to sort of talk about it. Got uh, my skills in terms of Unix and, and simulations and working on, on uh, big iron in terms of to doing that. I then moved on and came here to IPY in Department of Chemistry and ran NIH funded molecular modeling lab. We actually did do some, some GABA modeling um, of the ion channels at that point in time of structure-based uh, ones to connect in. I did a quick uh, foray into uh, doing a co-founder of a startup into coupons at time right before everything tanked um, and just not the right time. I also did a quick foray uh, when uh, Michael Mokurabi came, where as a lead developer um, in VR systems, again, maybe a little bit ahead of my time um, in terms of where we were. Uh, in terms of that. I had the opportunity to go to Eli Lilly in uh, 2000, uh, starting as an individual contributor, um, computational chemistry, chem informatics, doing predictive modeling, um, moving up to structural biology and ultimately leading the research um, IT organization globally. Um, and then uh, I went on loan to IBRI to help them get started in data analytics side uh, and then uh, became permanent there uh, mid last year. Uh, so key question, does anyone know what a T-shaped individual is? Okay. Um, this is a term that comes from HR, Google use it or otherwise, um, and I think that will help explain sort of me a little bit, and I'll do another quick thing. Um, so a T-shaped individual is someone who can go really deep in science and technology, uh, but they also have the broadness to move across either the soft skills, the knowledge, um, the ability to move across a lot of different um, uh, both areas or not. I've always found in my career that taking something that worked well in one area, translate into other makes a, makes a um, difference. So let me continue moving on a little bit here. Uh, and just pulling up, uh, I do have quite a bit of uh, publications across a lot of different um, uh, areas. I went to the Naval Research Lab to do the, and I clipped it just to show the detonations at nanometer resolution using molecular dynamics. Uh, that didn't actually lead to my uh, top 
paper, my top paper, actually is the energetics of, of nanotubules, carbon nanotubes. I actually was there at the right time when I could actually do some critical work in terms of that that I showed on, on the other slide. Also have done stuff in docking that we did at Lilly, a um, variety of other uh, things relative to oral drugs and continuing to understand. Now, if you look at my top, uh, oh, I also did a, um, a uh, video clip actually long ago that was in the BBC uh, Horizon series. But a quick note for those who like data, um, you sort of look at my top two publications and say, wow, that's really interesting. You know, if you just use single metrics of number of citations, um, both of them look, uh, you know, you definitely have one above the other. But if you start looking at um, how they are progressing over time, one has plateaued. Um, still surprisingly after 30 years, um, getting 30 plus citations a year. Another one, and I still don't know why, I haven't looked into it, is actually seeing a lot more citations recently in terms of the docking. Probably means that we have a lot more crystal structures available that people are doing, and so they're going back and using these new ma these methodologies to solve new, new type things going forward. Um, so coming, coming forward on this, um, this was what I was actually told a long time ago in a summer research program, that someday I'd get serious about research. Um, I hope you'd see that I am serious about research, but I'm serious about doing it a different way. That's the lead in in terms of where we want to go. For those counting, 20% um, done, let's talk on um, IBRI. Uh, IBRI was really um, initiated by a report that said, with all the great um, uh, life sciences companies that we have, with the the great academic institutions with Regenstrief, all of the substrate we have here, somehow it doesn't seem like we're capturing the talent, we're capturing the, the uh, research funds that we should be able to do here in Indiana with all of the talent we have. Um, so IBRI was started with a um, goal to bridge between academic institutions, um, even small tech, I'd hope to say in terms of this, and industry to really drive translational into different ways. Um, and so our goal is to really be that bridge between a lot of the different capabilities. Um, and I sort of feel with my career, I've been in government labs, I've been in the academics and, and trying to work with industry, I've been in industry trying to work with academics and small tech. I've got those experiences, and so how can we do uh, things that really drive things forward? Now, like with anyone, you have to have a mission, so our mission really is industry-inspired, uh, applied um, in cardiometabolic um, disease, diabetes, uh, metabolic disease, poor nutrition. Uh, that's because of the state. We want to build a world-class organization um, that catalyzes activities across Indiana and beyond. Uh, scientific excellence, it starts, starts with quality, um, entrepreneurial, how do you translate it, and then collaborative nature. So how do we do this and why are we unique? We really want to catalyze the activities. We don't have to do everything, but if we can, if we can catalyze and be the the um, piece that that can get things going, then we can make a difference. We collaborate. We don't have to own everything. We need to work in a networked way um, in the ecosystem and build that. Uh, we need to complement. We don't need to reproduce or redo things that are here. Don't need to be competitive. Right? We've got a lot of talent here. How do we align it to value, things of value? And we can convene people together, have people come together. A lot of big science, a lot of the challenges we're facing, um, as was just talked about in the prior talk, uh, needs large teams and large players to do it, each of them playing their roles well. And then ultimately, sometimes it's just about connecting people together. Um, so we are just still relatively new. We've gone from uh, roughly three years ago, uh, four, one, of, one to four people. Uh, we were at about 22 at the start of the year. We're now at about 37, so we are continuing to grow. What are the areas of focus? Um, I, I handle the applied data sciences. We've got Teresa Mastracci, who's also connected with um, IU. She's handling uh, Regenta Medicine, looking at really interesting pathways for type 1 diabetes using both human tissue, uh, mouse models, and zebrafish. 
Uh, Mike Pooch is doing single cell. Uh, how can you do rare cells down to whole, uh, very low levels? Um, think liquid bi biopsies in terms of that. And the most recent individual um, is now uh, Vidati Yusuboff, who's coming with her biological side. Because lots of times, if you understand disease biology, if you understand it through the data analytics side and you identify new targets, sometimes the best way to go is through a biologic. Um, and so just to um, make this also current, because we are doing a couple changes it was just actually announced um, uh, a week or so ago, um, okay, maybe a couple weeks ago, um, Lilly's new Diabetes Center of Excellence at IBRI. This is joint between Eli Lilly, IU School of Medicine, and IBRI to really recruit national really recognized talent in diabetes, uh, bring them, some of them are actually bringing them back to IU. They actually were trained in IU School of Medicine, uh, bring them back and and place them in IBRI's labs with the staff and um, and drive them forward. And Lily's interest, because they now you brought uh, talent closer. They don't have to go across the nation. Um, IU, it helps build the capabilities and diabetes research uh, center there. And again, is a key part of how do we grow the ecosystem. Um, so moving on, um, let me talk a little bit about what I've been doing um, for the past uh, a lot of time. Um, so one of the early things we recognized um, that was recognized in the Patel is that um, really Indiana is unique. Um, what we have with life sciences companies as well as the uh, universities is unique. We have almost one of everything. Um, in fact, uh, when BioCrossroads was working on this, we are number two in life sciences exports in the nation, second only to California, and we have a base of 6 million people as opposed to 33 million. Um, so on a per capita, we are number one in life science. Why? Because we have Eli Lilly in therapeutics. We have Roche Diagnostics. We have Cook Medical, the largest uh, medical devices here. We have the ortho side that is up there. We have Dow Agro that now is um, part of Corteva, uh, Dow DuPont. And then you look across there in terms of the largest um, school of medicine. We've got a variety of those other things coming forward. So the key questions for me really around um, 2016 was, well, how are we going to meet the vision of um, IBRI? How do we how do we operate? What what makes us um, different? How can we compete? Um, especially because I was brought in for big data, data analytics, all these type things. And how am I going to compete with a Google or an Apple or otherwise? And so that's what I hope to show you is that how we are starting to break through some of those issues and solve problems um, in ways that are a little bit different um, going forward. So this goes back to um, really coming on now three years ago, I came into IBRI, I talked with a lot of the scientific advisory board across a lot of different uh, disciplines, did a lot of work, and I said aspirationally this is what IBRI wants to do in terms of really uh, identify substrate for life sciences partners in new therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, nutrition, and wellness programs. We don't have to do everything, but how do we catalyze and, and help them accelerate those efforts? So originally said, yes, we could probably do that if we could start understanding the data, data, getting access, integrating, and learning from that data. The challenge is if you're in cardiometabolic disease, which is almost a more of a syndrome than a specific disease when you get to type 2 diabetes, um, how are you going to do it? Because it is related to ge your genetics. It is related um, to how your biology works as you go from the translational down to it. But it's related on where we live. What are our risk factors? What are um, the behaviors? What do we do individually? So it became very very clear we had to actually start integrating across research data, clinical data, socioeconomic data, and personal data. Now, we're not the only ones. I've been, been inspired by others or other ones. One of the ones looking at the creative destruction of medicine is Eric Topol looking again at how do you look at all of the different types of data that you need to go um, at to really understand a holistic view of health, um, especially in an area where there's huge behavioral components or environmental factors. Um, so moving on in that, we've sort of came back and did a quadrant view. I'm now simplifying this, but the, the goal I set up was could we actually start identifying and um, leveraging Indiana as a way to integrate across those. 
And so coming back to sort of just refresh, um, we have IBRI that has a unique environment where expertise is in reach. Even this organization or School of Medicine, right? Regan Street with its history of electronic medical records, um, Indiana with its history of insulin um, and diagnostics with the, the, the Unimeter. So we have the expertise here in terms of this. Um, we're tasked with a very difficult um, and very broad one. And so it's how do we understand metabolic health in a different way? We need to integrate across a lot of different multiple data sets that for any of you doing data analytics, it's always 80% of your time is spent in cleaning the data, getting it ready for analysis. In fact, I sat at Lilly in an auditorium one time, um, sitting next to someone and said, Dan, I'm doing something wrong. I said, I'm trying to solve this problem. I've got all this various data, you know, and it's just taken me forever to do that. I said, sounds like you're doing something right. Um, because most of your time is doing that. So we can break some of that and, and transfer across. And so the challenge for me at the time was to prove that IBRI could actually become a collaboration hub, innovation across there, um, the various things, leveraging uh, regional resources and moving forward. So just to reiterate again, um, in terms here and move forward, uh, this was the uh, problem and what we're trying to do in terms of bridging the gap. Uh, where are we? And I'm going to sort of um, tell you a little bit about the end story and then fill in and then come back. But um, if you look at the problems that we've been working on on solving, what are the obesity rates um, statewide? One of my first projects I'll talk about a little bit. Can we understand human environmental toxicity? Lily has generates compounds that are um, go into humans directly. Dow Agro does uh, compounds that go into the environment that we ingest. Can we better understand, which is one of my largest projects with Regan Streif and Eli Lilly and Roche, can we better understand type 2 diabetes um, through electronic health records? Uh, can we move from subjective to objective disease me measures using something like digital biomarkers, uh, predictive modeling? Can you predict the chance? Now, to do these things, to show the complexity of the problem, and I'll, I'll redo this, is really about eight projects or collaborations we have ongoing, um, roughly four industrial sponsors or state sponsors that we do, six partners, uh, more than 40 agreements um, in terms of doing. So it's not always just a technical problem. We're breaking, breaking down organizational and bureaucratic barriers to be able to do that. Um, so we think that we can be the place to drive some of these problems uh, going forward. So continuing on, I sort of talked about this as I was coming into the environment and understanding what we had. Um, I was talking with the state, the Management Performance Hub, uh, IHI, uh, talking with um, Jen Walthall, who's now um, moved from the State Department of Health to uh, FSSA, and they had nothing going on in, in KPIs at that point for the state in terms of what they wanted to prove was it's changed a little bit now, infant mortality, um, smoking cessation and obesity. Um, and they had, not, they had programs going on on two of those, not something going on the third. I said, great, it aligns to our strategy and our mission. Let's see what we can do. So we grabbed data from a variety of different sources, integrated them together, actually found some things uh, in IHI, and which would then replicate in INPC, where we were not capturing some of the data from e EHRs um, or EMRs. Um, and uh, now, of course, Regan Street has the ability to go directly into EMRs in terms of doing that. But now it allowed us to actually uh, push uh, Indiana and the state and our policies in terms of saying, how do we better set up the data for understanding our human health care um, and our citizens' health in terms of here, and do it from an evidence-based, data-driven way. Um, this really led, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, about type 2 diabetes project. I'll go into a little more detail in that, so I won't belabor this point here. The other project that we have going on in predicting human toxicity, um, we've now had a, um, this has been going on probably ultimately be a two-year project, uh, basically a nine-month um, uh, pilot phase where we generate the website to pull the bioinformatics capabilities together. Uh, we actually showed this at SOT, um, and we've taken the best uh, capabilities from Eli Lilly, Dow, put them together um, into a system so that others can use it. So it's a giving, actually taking a reverse 
from industry giving back to academics. And our plan is to open source it, make it available, and hopefully drive research better there. Um, and this is actually a finalist in the Agro, uh, which is their industry um, group, Agro 2018 Awards for the best industry collaboration. So November, we may know if we've uh, we've won in that. Uh, that website is out there available. If you go to uh, ctox.indianabiosciences.org. Um, the other one we are doing now um, is uh, digital biomarkers. We've actually done work inspired by Eli Lilly to can we collect subject or objective data differently um, when we primarily use patient reported outcomes using devices. Um, I've actually got one I'm exploring here, digital device. I've got one on here, which is an Empatica E4. Can we start understanding those and use those sign signatures? Lots of challenges in terms of doing that because it's, it's uh, variable in terms of human, it's variable in terms of compliance, it's variable in terms of uh, the quality of the data coming back. So I think there's lots of challenges is before we actually go from digital captured data to truly digital biomarkers. Hasn't stopped tech from sort of um, doing a lot of work in there. Uh, sorry, uh, we are competing as well in the Inject Tech Challenge. Uh, Congratulations to, to, to Josh Best as being one of the finalists. Uh, this project is actually one of the finalists as well. So we'll know next week maybe in terms of where we are. But I think both, uh, as I've seen both of the projects and everything, um, doesn't really matter. We're still continuing to drive innovation here. So let me talk a little bit more. This was inspired by uh, work that was done at um, uh, Mount Sinai in terms of looking at uh, healthcare data and trying to understand the complexity of uh, type 2 diabetes and how its comorbidities um, and or the complications of type 2 diabetes when uncontrolled really exhibit. Um, and in fact, there's more, most recently been another paper that comes out that says we've usually talked about type 2 diabetes as one type. Um, now they're coming back and saying there's multiple and the Mount Sinai even says that uh, because of the complexity of the disease, uh, it will exhibit in different issues. And it's not really type 2 diabetes that's the issue, it's the complications there of microvascular, macrovascular, that cause you the issues in terms of this. So building on, as you guys are aware, um, in terms of the um, uh, basically the data that's available from INPC, uh, and this is with Lilly, Roche, Regan, Shreve, Notre Dame, and in this one I missed it, it's IU in there, my other slides have that correct. We have um, downloaded uh, type 2 diabetes patients, uh, based upon diagnosis codes, uh, medications, and or um, lab results, so any of those inclusion criteria, We've done a control set. We're looking at uh, the uh, complications that are listed up there in very small type. Um, roughly uh, uh, about 2 million patients, a little over. Um, not a huge amount when you talk about genomic sequencing. I mean, when I started looking at this data, um, very much less than what we have in genomic sequencing. Um, but it is very complex in the um, in the different types of data, the error rates, the other type of things you have to do to really clean and integrate this data to be able to do make what we'd call a research quality data set that then allows you to really drive results. So where are we going in this? Um, really, uh, basically, Lily is looking comorbid these subgroups. They really want to try and understand fast, slow progressives, people who are not responding to medications or otherwise, and try and understand the biological basis for that. If you can, then you can uh, do what they have going forward. Obviously, one of them is, is subgroups and, and basically machine learning unsupervised in terms of doing this, but also Roche is doing more supervised learning in terms of this, uh, where they actually have validated on this data set a predictive model of what's your probability of getting chronic kidney disease within um, Three, three years of uh, first diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, you can understand why that may be critical. As we go forward, if we can understand the hints and predict what people will potentially get, we can change treatment, we can monitor differently, and we can transform healthcare in here. So we're on our way in terms of that. Where are we at now? We're uh, doing a brand new data extract. It gives us access to more of the medications, more modern medications. Um, we have a paper that's ready to go, um, and we are looking at hopefully doing set on empirical pedigrees because we ultimately want to do um, patient subgroups and cohort identification from EHR and actually start doing uh, with Indiana Biobank um, some uh, sample collection from those subgroups. So rather than just uh, in a broad swath, collect biological data be a very focused strategic way that we collect. 
Um, we've done a little bit of other work in here, and you can't really see this, but Sankey diagrams looking at disease progression. How do they progress? How, how fast do they go? How many go into different progressions um, in terms of this? And then we think that if we can really understand that um, better, then we can drive uh, understanding. We've got a paper in, in uh, that has been approved now um, in terms of looking at other ways with Notre Dame to, to say, how do you do disease understanding driving forward, understand such as heart failure, slow, fast progresses, why do they? Why do they under certain medications? Um, again, we are the catalyst for doing this. We're not doing all the work ourselves. Uh, in fact, every Friday, the team from Lilly is at IBRI working on the data sets, working on their in a collaboration. Uh, Roche is, is working uh, remotely. So we think this is an opportunity to continue to bring the right people together. And thanks again to Titus as my key partner in that project because it wouldn't have been uh, able to do it without. Um, I still recall my first meetings with Sean and Titus in terms of talking aspirationally what we wanted to do and it's nice to see it come to fruition and then build on what we can do in the future. So I hope you want to sort of say as we look and this is my four quadrant reduced down where we started doing projects um, where we're looking across socioeconomic, we're looking across clinical data um, and organizationals and we're doing toxicogenomics and we're basically doing digital uh, biomarkers. So we're trying to go across the whole spectrum of types of data, working with the right partners, working with um, them to sort of say, how do we drive these interesting collaborations um, in ways that drive disease understanding differently? Um, so we're on our way. Um, can we scale? Can we do more? Can we catalyze more? Uh, that becomes a, a resource strategic priorities. We are just now redoing our strategy in terms of what we want to do as a group, as an organization, building on the successes. We are a startup. We are we do pivot um, and continue to change as we go. Um, so in the midst of redoing this, it's now different than my five-year strategy of last year. So. Uh, go forward if a strategy only lasts is one year. Um, the environment's changing pretty fast. Uh, but we do think that we can, across these areas, be a place to have access. That's around how do you do it securely with quality um, and in the right data use agreements and all of the requirements that you have in there. Can we get the access to data? Can we put it in a form that's useful? Can we drive integration platforms? And in places where data doesn't exist now, like digital biomarkers, can we generate data in a quality way? Um, we want to do it as a collaboration hub, the five C's that I talked about. Um, we want to be really good um, at understanding problems and how do you translate nebulous ideas into really uh, tight project plans and business so we can drive forward and go to go and no go. And we are because we work with industrial partners. They always push us in terms of saying, what's your deliverables? And are you meeting those um, on time, on budget, um, on delivery uh, to get answers to quickly? So almost done. Let me talk about what's going to just happen up the road, and then we'll have time for maybe a question or so. If not, catch me afterwards. 16 Tech, the IBRI's future home. Um, if you haven't heard, um, there was an announcement just this morning um, that came out, a press release that the new building, uh, basically that I'll show in the next one, Building One, which was the catalyst for this, of which IBRI will uh, be a tenant. Um, also, IU School of Medicine will be a tenant for their uh, regenerative medicine and their collaborative uh, efforts. And now CICP and BioCrossroads have shown that they will be in there. Uh, this is what's going to happen just north of us. Um, in fact, if you look on this slide, you will see, um, if I can find my mouse here somewhere. Um, okay, if you can see right here, this is where we are now. There will be a bridge, an iconic bridge that it connects right, right to the north. So hopefully right out this road, you'll be able to just walk into the district. Um, the district is planned to be a high density urban innovation district work, live, play. Um, buildings there for um, the, uh, basically the work, the industry as I talk about, the innovation, but also retail. 
um, restaurants, even a hotel in the future, and housing in terms of this. And so this has been on the target for the Indiana, Indi uh, Indianapolis now for 10 years to redevelop the site. Uh, IBI actually acted as a catalyst to that, and it will be our home. We will be building number one in terms of here. Um, our hope is you'll see cranes going up in the next uh, month or two. Groundbreaking is next. Next. Uh, next week so you can see the planned IBRI um, location so this will be a Regan Street will be a short walk on a nice day um, from here so we really look forward to this great bridge um, great connectivity in terms there and as I said we will be in building one um, the, that's the first building it will be lab based so uh, difference with an IBRI we do have labs uh, we are doing biological work so it's not just data I'm maybe the uh, difference in terms of there uh, but we also will have IU School of Medicine there's talk about IU informatics uh, we're building collaborative spaces so people can come there and work there as well if they're in the district um, and or industrial partners there. And we really, uh, Rob Lyles, who's from Cook Regentech, basically, uh, and the former CEO of IBRI, sort of talk about innovation as a collision sport, right? How do you connect people? How do you get them together? How do you let the ideas go? Um, and so that's what you'll see going up. So at this point uh, on time, let me just go ahead and stop. So thank you. Probably time for a, maybe a question, and if not, you can catch me offline. Yeah. A great question. Just for if you can zoom in a little bit and describe the Institute as an organization, what's the feature that are different in your organization cluster of human right. than, let's say, Indiana CTSI, um, Lilly, um, uh, Regan Shreve, is right. it simply right. uh, the, 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 yeah, I don't understand the operation. So, so, right. so yeah, and, and that's a good question. And, and what I will say is we get that question all the time. And, and I will say uh, we think we have an opportunity to be different, to really bridge between organizations, uh, lower the barriers for doing collaborative team science uh, by doing that. Um, let me just say a couple examples, I didn't talk about this. Lots of times to do some of these collaborations, you need data use agreements, we use uh, basically research agreements, and uh, everyone knows that takes a long time to, to do. Uh, because we are industry focused, we actually already have um, sort of, uh, you know, the interest and uh, the organizations to make it successful. My first uh, multi-way collaborative agreement with Lilly and Roche, um, and IBRI took three months. My second one took two weeks. Um, so if we can build the organizational relationships, if we can build the processes and capabilities to work between as an independent not-for-profit, uh, we're working with IU, we're also working with Purdue, we're working with Notre Dame, there's an MOU in how we operate. We are part of CTSI. Um, we are part of the organization here. We think we can be a way to actually catalyze and lower the barriers, bureaucratic or otherwise, um, to really drive some of these projects forward. Um, we want to be a place where people collaborate, come. Sometimes we'll just be a connector. We'll be just a piece to help the environment go. Um, but we think with our applied focus, with our industrial um, sponsorship, with the way we're networking, with the way we're trying to do the business model different in terms of our foundation and philanthropic funding, um, we'll be able to drive a, a, a different model. But it's not, it's complementary to what School of Medicine doing. It's complementary to Regan's Reef. We hope in the future as we grow, we'll only be maybe 120 people to 200. We will not be successful if we don't engage the whole ecosystem and help the whole ecosystem be more successful. So that's why we keep coming back to the complementary, the five C's. Um, all the leaders who are on our board are top level leaders of most of these organizations. They're helping guide so that IBRI becomes a asset in addition to all of our other assets here. Uh, but I will say that that's why we're redoing our five year strategy plan again. We continue as we grow and find those things. We're sort of are acting as a more agile organization and shifting a little bit. So what I'd say is that's what I can give you at the moment, but stay tuned. Um, and I'd come back and say, if you have things where with, you know, we can help, 
we will always be almost, uh, I would say, sort of behind other organizations, helping other organizations be successful. Uh, we have no intent necessarily to be frontline with patients, right? We have no intent to be, uh, we can't commercialize various things. They have to spin them out. We expect, you know, when we deliver success, it will be adopted by other, other people in terms of their, we just want to be a place to lower the barriers, make everyone more successful. Okay, thank you all.